Hi everyone, welcome to Five Code Shakespeare Hamlet theme analysis. In this series, we look at a total of 14 different themes, and in this one, we'll look at thought versus action. Five reasons to explain why Hamlet can't make up his mind. What I do in each video is first identify important aspects of each theme and apply them to the play, and then we dig deeply into the text and pull out several quotes to prove the connection. If you find these videos useful, please like and subscribe, and if you make a donation, you get a complete set of the PDFs I use in this series. See the description for details. Oscar Wilde wrote, the man who sees both sides of a question is a man who sees absolutely nothing. Now, we usually think of the ability to see both sides of an issue as a, as a noble thing and an, and an intelligent thing, too, because you're smart enough to, to, to think broadly and deeply and complexly, you see. Uh, but Wilde's point here is that it's th that information becomes use useless. Sure, you can see everything, but you can't act on anything. You can't you can't solve real world problems because you're 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 stuck in the middle between two uh, options, and that's certainly Hamlet's problem. He's certainly intelligent. There's lots of evidence. His his banter, his quick wit. Oh, he, he demonstrates his quick wit from the very beginning of the play right through to the end of the play. So have a look at that for evidence that he's smart. If you need if you need that evidence, uh, but that that intelligence leads to this useless overthinking, and that's why he's paralyzed. So acting without thinking can lead to disaster if you if you if you act on impulse you're going to ruin your life guaranteed however thinking without acting is is can be equally ruinous because you don't do anything in the world you just sit on your hands and, and and nothing happens in your life so acting on an issue requires the ability to ignore contradictory truths that's what wild was getting at i think you have to ignore potentially complicating factors yes this is a problem i see it on the edge on the, my peripheral with my peripheral vision i see the problem but I know that understanding that and going in that direction is not going to help us. So let's forget about that and do this. That's what Hamlet is not able to do. Uh, life is full of these unpleasant trade-offs and they must be made in order for uh, us to act in the world. So Hamlet's intelligence is not that kind of shrewd intelligence that I was just talking about. Forget this, I got to get here. So I'm going to focus only on that. His intelligence is not that shrewd, pragmatic, political intelligence like Claudius's. He's a John of Dreams. He actually calls himself that, as we've discussed. He's a John of Dreams, and he's introspective, poetic, melancholic, philosophical, theoretical. He's, not, he's a guy for the ivory tower. He should be writing books of poetry, and everything that he would write would be true, do you see? But useless in the sense that we're talking about. Useless in the Claudius, real-world, pragmatic, Machiavellian kind of way. It's really, really interesting, and it's torturous. And Shakespeare, we almost, I, I feel Shakespeare's pain in this. Shakespeare being a very, very uh, um, uh, introspe introspective kind of guy, wise kind of guy. Uh, but he was good, and he was a Claudius kind of guy in the real world as well. He was very, very rich. He was a shrewd, shrewd businessman. So I think he's wrestling with these two sides of himself uh, in, in, in this play. Or at least or at least revealing, I don't know if he was wrestling, I think he was probably very, very happy with his business acumen, uh, but he's revealing the, 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 the two poles of, of, of intelligence, I suppose. So Hamlet is trained to see all sides of an issue. He's a scholar. He's, he's a scholar. And as, we, as suggested in his wit, he's a pretty good scholar. He's trained to see all sides of, 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 of an issue, and he's very, very good at it. Uh, every delay and caveat is justified logically. Every time he dithers, there's a good reason for that dithering. Like a good philosopher would lay it all out on the, on the, on the table and spend you know, his life gazing at that layout on the table and not acting in the real world. So this intelligence, as we've discussed, leads to paralysis, the, the frustration, the shame, and the, the neurosis, do you see? So here's the most famous example of that. He's ready to kill Claudius in Act 3, Scene 3. He says, now might I do it, Pat? Now he's praying, he's vulnerable, and now I'll do it. And so he goes to heaven, and so I am revenged. And then he can't shut his brain up. His, his hand, here's the hand. We've talked about the hand. Let the firstlings of my heart be the firstlings of my hand. That's what he should have done if he was a Macbeth kind of character, as we've discussed. But he doesn't. He can't shut up his brain. And he says, wait a minute, wait a minute, that should be scanned. Uh, another example here, he's talking to Horatio. That's the famous uh, skull scene where he's at the graveside and he's looking at the skull. And of course, his melancholic imagination goes where it will go. And Hamlet says to Horatio, why may not imagination trace the noble dust of Alexander, Alexander the Great, the great uh, conquering hero from Macedonia? Uh, 
May not imagination trace the noble dust of Alexander till it find it stopping a bunghole. So it's, it's a philosophical existential musing that he's doing here, and it's absolutely correct, and it's absolutely beautiful, and we all love it, and we all recognize it. Our, we're dust to dust. We're going to return. That's basically what he's saying. And Horatio says, dude, you know what? You lighten up. To or to consider too curiously to think so. Here's a here's Horatio. Here's a guy maybe not as intelligent as Hamlet. Certainly not as melancholic and 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 all of that neurotic stuff that we've talked about already. Uh, as Hamlet, uh, he's more balanced. He can live in the real world. He's not a monster who's who's capable of thriving in the real world like like Claudius in the way that Claudius thrives uh, he's more balanced maybe somewhere between the two and not being super intelligent and certainly not sensitive we're going to talk about sensitivity as well uh, 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 makes it easier to live in the world for sure so shut up Killjoy would you, would you like to have him out uh, at, a, at a party you know he'd be the doom and gloom guy because he can't shut off his brain Okay, so let's apply this, uh, what we've just talked about, to, to his intelligence, to the cultural elements that, are, that, that, that force him to look at the two sides of an issue. Hamlet is too intelligent not to consider all of the cultural forces that are pulling, in, pulling him in one direction or the other. Um, I've talked about the Christian worldview uh, versus the, the, the ancient heroic warrior worldview in my revenge series. Um, so, so go have a look at that for more detail. But here's how it applies to thought versus action. So do, do his inability not to think, his high intelligence. Hamlet is torn between his duty to uphold the ancient heroic code of revenge. That's what he's being called upon to do uh, by his father, the ghost of his father, uh, and his understanding understanding of modern Christian civilization's precepts, which, uh, which forbid that heroic action, D.C. So that's why he's torn in these two directions. Christianity posed two barriers to, to revenge. There was a personal afterlife. A personal afterlife means that when you die, you will return as you, and you will live out eternity as you, either being rewarded in heaven or punished in hell. So it was a big deal in the Christian belief system, and it must be considered before acting. So every action that you made on earth when you before you made that action you had to consider how it will affect your afterlife dc and and we're going to see how that applies to uh, to hamlet's that that causes hamlet to dither in this play christian virtues were were passive merciful and and, and full of forgiveness dc to uh, uh, turn the other cheek not active retributive violence revenge was the purview of god in the bible the Bible actually says here, it says, Dearly beloved, God says, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. So let wrath go, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord, do you see? So if, if you are a smart person and you know your, your cultural uh, um, uh, uh, precepts like these, then that's going to be at least at the back of your mind. And in Hamlet, it's, it's, it's more than at the, at the back of his mind. So, so these principles of, of belief restricted what a modern, intellectual, thoughtful, revenging hero could do. You can't, just, you can't just act without thinking. You have to consider these things if you're a thinker. If you're not a thinker like Laertes or Claudius, then you don't really worry about it too much, and you just act, and you'll suffer the consequences in the future. But Hamlet can't unthink, do you see? So here's an example of that. So that would be scanned, he said, as we've discussed. He's about to kill Claudius, and he says, yes, now he's praying. Now I can... Now I can do it easily. Now I can do it pat. And then he stops and he says, that would be scanned. Okay, here it is. Look at the logic. This is, this, is, these are the, this is the language of a philosopher. This is a syllogism. He's thinking logically through this. He says, okay, uh, a villain kills my father. And for that, I, his sole son, do this same villain send to heaven. And look at the pause there at the end. So there's a philosopher thinking. He says, why? The result, logically is that I'm being paid to kill him. He should pay me to do this, th to do this. This is hiring salary, not revenge. So, so the smart guy considers the implications. The implications of doing what he would do right now would mean that he's rewarded in heaven because he's, he's absolved himself. He's prayed, he's absolved himself, and so he can go to heaven instead of to hell. And my father, apparently, is in purgatory. So that would be higher in salary. And look at the, the language here. The enjambment creates this weighty pause to heaven. He can't, he's, he's saying, heaven, I'm not going to send this guy to heaven. It's logical. So yeah, we can scream at Hamlet for being a ditherer, but he's log he, He's right. He's absolutely right. And that's, that's where, where, where this play, trying to understand Hamlet and Hamlet, poor Hamlet, trying to understand himself is just, it's just, it's, it's a nightmare. 
Uh, here's another example of that, of, of the implications of these, this, the, the Christian notions of an afterlife, um, um, how real they were in those days. The ghost says, dude, I was cut off. I was murdered in the blossoms of my sin. I didn't, I wasn't able to absolve myself because I was murdered uh, b before I, I was able to do that. Unhouseled, disappointed, un unannulled, no reckoning made, but sent to my account with all my imperfections on my head. It was horrible, horrible, almost horrible. So dying without absolving yourself of sins was a big, big deal. And Hamlet's smart for uh, for thinking about this and yet we want to wring his neck because he can't do the job that he's supposed to do so thought versus action for the cultural reasons so that was the reason that that was why he dithered uh, committing murder and now we'll talk about why he dithers uh, uh, um, trying to commit suicide let's just return to the revenge the, the the injunction against revenge for a moment so hamlet directly in the play hamlet directly mentions the christian injunction against suicide which we'll look at uh, but not against revenge hamlet there's never never anywhere in the play that i can remember where hamlet says that oh i'm not supposed to get revenge because god told me not to do you see uh, however laertes's defiance of the rules against revenge draws attention to the prohibition as a very good cause for hamlet's uh, hesitation. So Laertes, in several places in the play, he says he basically this. He says, to hell allegiance, vows to the blackest devil, conscience and grace to the profoundest pit. And these are both religious concepts of, of God's goodness, DC. Divine prohibition against revenge be damned. I'm going to commit revenge. I will cut Hamlet's throat in the church, is what he says, DC. So as a character foil, his uh, his his courage in defying the laws against revenge uh, reflects on Hamlet uh, and we see that Hamlet uh, as we've looked at already he, 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 he can't not think about the injunction against revenge uh, not so Laertes Laertes is more the man of action so to the suicide question suicide is not directly mentioned in the Bible as a mortal sin uh, uh, that 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 was true but it was generally accepted in Shakespeare's time uh, uh, and and it, uh, as 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 a sin and it was enforced as such it was actually enforced and we see two statements at least two statements uh, uh, declaring that uh, in in Act One Hamlet says. Uh, with his death, death wish, he says, Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, resolve itself into a do. I wish I could just disappear. Or I wish that God had not fixed his laws against self-slaughter. So there it is. There's a, there's, a, there's a clear statement. And these thoughts lead to his inability to commit suicide, DC, which I suppose is a good thing. Uh, in Act Five, towards the end here, uh, we, when, when uh, after Ophelia has has died and they're burying Ophelia, Laertes is outraged that she doesn't get a proper Christian burial, ensuring that her soul will go to heaven. Do you see? Laertes says to the priest, "What else are you going to do? What ceremony else?" He repeats that twice, by the way, and the priest says, "Her obsequies have been." as far enlarged as we have warranty. I can't do any more than this. I'm sorry, brother. Her death was doubtful. It looked like a suicide, so there's nothing we can do. And but that great command or sways the order she should in ground unsanctified have lodged until the end of eternity. So she has to spend the rest of eternity in an unsanctified grave. So again, uh, I point this out to, to, to show that Hamlet is not wrong in considering the afterlife. He actually is probably smarter than than, uh, than Laertes, or is even more, more cowardly than Laertes? There's no answer. There's absolutely no answer to that question. So the implications were very real, as I've said. Hamlet's thinking is justified, rational, and re responsible. It sure is, and we have two two pieces of lots of evidence for that. However, it's all in question as well. Is is he overthinking, or is he just thinking? Uh, what do we admire more? Do we admire Hamlet's wise caution or Laertes's passionate action? There's no answer can be found. It's, it's absolutely infuriating. Okay, so the next reason for Hamlet's inaction is his sensitive nature. He is a highly sensitive person. And that was Hamlet theme analysis, thought versus action, five reasons why Hamlet can't act. Um, come back for my next video and we'll look at existentialism. I hope you found these videos useful. And if you did, please like and subscribe and pick up a copy of your PDFs if you need them. Thanks for watching.